bullying. The Me Too violence, movement against toxic sexual harassment. Masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says it's a problem. She's lost. She's lost. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big. Yo, men. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. So how do we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. All right, we're going to start with this, and I'm sure that you are aware of the uh, furor around the Gillette ad that we've uh, just showed you. And calls, growing calls from some quarters to ban the razor brand for slating men. Hailed as the first ad to respond to the growing hashtag MeToo movement, the ad criticizes everyday occurrences of so-called toxic masculinity and says men can do better in 2019. But here's the question. Did the ad actually push boundaries? And what does this mean for the future of so-called woke advertising here and abroad? Pumio Mashiko is with us from the Ignitive Agency and Cabello Lehlongwane from FCB in Johannesburg. Hopefully, the two of them are going to shed some light on, of the, on this issue. Uh, Cabello, did you shave with a Gillette razor this morning? No, I, I literally, in protest, I stopped. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit perplexed as to what the controversy is, to yeah. be perfectly honest. I shaved, and I used to be a Gillette user, and if I still was shaving the regular way, I would have no problem continuing the, you know, shaving with the Gillette products. So, Pumi, where's the controversy? Explain this to us. Why is there this big hullabaloo? You know, I think what we've seen is we've seen Gillette do what every marketer dreams of. Yeah. They've used that zeitgeist and they've gotten into that sweet spot where what they've bought and planned for in their media has been tripled by... By the, us talking about look it. Look at yes. us here talking yeah, about yes. it. We've tripled it. And that kind of media yes. is what every marketer wants. Gillette's been declining. Their sales have been declining. Look at Gabelo. Men are growing their beers all over yeah. the world. And so they had to do something that that pushed the boundary, but also what they did was they were brave about the fact that they spoke to the person that buys their product. It's not a secret that the purchasing decision is made by women. And so they were very bold and they spoke to the person that makes the purchasing decision and men didn't like so that. So Cabello, why would a brand, and I buy the argument of declining sales, but yeah. why would a brand risk something like this and alienating, which it has done, yeah. a vast group of its customers? It's not even a question of risk because not doing so is a different kind of risk. I think history will show uh, just behind the curve. This conversation is going to get to this point. It's a question of who takes it there. I don't even think it's a risk. If you perceive it as a risk, my question is, what are the stakes? You know, what are the real stakes? You don't have this conversation, somebody else will, and um, you might lose out in the, in the long run. But what consumers notice if the brand wasn't having that conversation had they been pushed into a place where they had no choice but to do so i, I think as part of the as you mentioned um the zeitgeist right if you want to have a, a sense of what a brand is or isn't you must look at the brands that are staying silent about things not so much those that are being vocal one way or another yeah. you know, they silence uh, kind of implies complicity in what's going on and especially given the billions of dollars they spent perpetuating a particular kind of um, image of men and women and the what they call you know toxic masculinity put me I, I know you don't speak for the brand but the the, the, the silence 
that Cabello is talking about. Would that brand have felt it insidiously uh, or is it just something that they felt they had to respond to? The what, brand was already suffering. The brand was already suffering. They had to do something to break out. They had to put themselves out there and they chose a very bold step. They put themselves out there in a way that nobody, I mean, really a razor blade ad is making headlines, but this is what they have done. They've taken a very bold step about that conversation and they have made it work for them. They've made it work for them. People are having this conversation anyway. So they're just part of it. The best a man can get, I mean, that, that just that line alone. Even if they just come out with yeah. an ad with just that line, I think they would have had controversy in this kind of environment that we're in with all of the, yeah. the total shutdowns, with the hashtag Me Too's, all of that kind of conversation that's happening in the space of consumers. Hmm, you have to do something that's really clever. And I think that they, they took a risk and the risk is paying off. All right, so both of you have used the word zeitgeist, so yep. I'm going to use it as well because it's just a nice word to use yeah. on a program like this that makes us all seem really smart. <laughs> Is this a sincere attempt then to tap into that zeitgeist that uh, Pumi is referring to, or are they simply climbing uh, on a popular band? Yeah, like a paying platitude to a popular Precisely. band. Precisely. Yeah. Look, um, I think there's a genuine attempt to tap into that zeitgeist and go slightly beyond. In what respect? What, what have you read into that? Well, what I read into that, first of all, as a um, you know, CMO, I'd be sitting there thinking, like, there's a conversation going on about toxic masculinity. I look at my show reel and I go, how much of that have I contributed? And just never mind the messaging, just in dollar value, right? Surely I have a responsibility to do something corrective. Now, do you take it to the extent of producing an ad? That's a different question. But certainly, you see the zeitgeist, you see how much you've got to do with it, and then you, you make a decision on what you're going to do about it. And I do think it's a sincere attempt to course correct in one way or another. My only kind of gripe is, um, what right do you have as a, as a brand to question the way I behave as a man? You know, like, you just sell razors. You should just keep quiet and make your razors, right? And the, the problem with, like, kind of that perspective, it kind of puts us in a situation that's only those who are intimately involved in the issues should be commenting on the issues, whereas, as you described, the zeitgeist is much bigger than razors. It's about who we are as people. So, Pumi, do brands then, in response to that, have a right, whether it's a razor brand or any other brand, to insert themselves into my life and my consciousness in that respect? That's what advertising does. Yeah. Advertising is a form of art, you know, just the creativity that goes into it. Not and all it's always advertising. Not all advertising, <laughs> of course, on. but it is a form of art. And, and it's important to understand, so what does art do in the space of our society? Is, is life imitating the art or is art imitating Life. And I think what they've done here with Gillette, and you see, for me, they were not tone deaf. So the commercial that they have created is one that, that unlike the Pepsi ad, didn't go completely wrong. This is a commercial that's set in a space where people are having relevant conversations. They're having relevant conversations, and no matter how heated those conversations are, no matter how polarized those conversations are, they were not tone deaf, and they set the right tone for what it is that they want their brand to be about. I just want to pick up on this, Andre. That what, what buys them, I think, um, or what they've earned um, by having contributed to such a large extent to the kind of, you know, the image of toxic miscellaneous is the things that they have done. So unlike Pepsi, Pepsi as a brand, you could argue that it's very difficult for them to talk about Black Lives Matter because they have got no, they've got no skin in the game. Whereas by virtue of Gillette's marketing over time, they've earned themselves skin in the game because they, as I've said, they've spent billions of dollars um, perpetuating a particular image of men and masculinity. Now they have the opportunity, and they, I think they grabbed it, to kind of try to do some course correction. The point is they've earned it through their own actions, I think. So there's a degree then of authenticity in terms of the strategy is what you're saying. Having said that though, okay, the genie has now been let out of the aftershave bottle. Boom, yeah. okay. Uh, you've got to sustain this. You can't just do the ad and then 
go back to what you were doing. Yeah. That, to me, is going to be the most difficult thing to do. How, Pumi Mashiko, does a brand do that? See, and I think, for me, this is where this case study is going to be fascinating in the couple of years to come. Because the conversation that they have started is a conversation that they have to keep having. Because it's not a conversation that's going away in the space of the consumer. It's a conversation that, if you think about Me Too and where it came from, and how that has evolved, and the kind of ramifications that it's had across all business sectors. I think that's what's going to be important. One of the campaigns that we were all very excited by, who also went slightly off center when Old Spice came out and they started targeting women. But you know what's happened with Old Spice? It kind of fizzled out very quickly. So it'll be interesting to see how oh, Chidesh can keep horse, the guy you know, on the, you know, the man, yeah. the, the yeah. man your man could smell like. The man your man could smell like. <laughs> yeah. He was a really <laughs> cool guy, by the way. I can't remember his name. Yeah. So similarly, Gillette's going to have to yeah. sustain this. If they fail to sustain it, then they will have created this whole big hullabaloo, and then they're going to disappoint all of us and all those women who are now making the decision to buy Gillette for their husbands and boyfriends and sons are probably going to go, eh, these guys have tricked me. And they're going to, you know, Women so they're going to Women don't see... buy razors for their partners, do they? When was the last time you bought a razor? I always buy my razors. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very specific about my razors. I'm very specific. You know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know nothing as far as that's <laughs> concerned. How do you sustain it? Um, I don't think, I mean, uh, this is going to be slightly controversial. I don't think it's going to be that hard. The, the, the most important thing is to maintain the intent. Because yeah. if, it, as a marketing team, if you're clear about your intent is that what you're doing is taking responsibility for your contribution to the state and course correcting through messaging and activity. The roadmap is pretty clear. You, all you have to do is really pick up on what people are doing and the like reasonable interventions that you can make. And by the way, beyond the phone. The film is one aspect of it. What what else are you kind of going to be doing? And I think all you have to do is let's just look around at what people are saying and what the sentiment is um, across the board. So quick answer from both of you. Uh, time is against us. Is this a conversation then that is starting to find any traction in this country in terms of big brands? Of course. Um, if, you, if you're a big brand and you're not having this conversation, um, you're going to find yourself in a compromise in one way or another pretty soon. And it's just the only thing that I feel like is weird um, is to isolate it to woke advertising. It's yeah. like on Mondays and Wednesdays, we woke advertise. The rest of the time, we destroy the world. It's like <laughs> a strange way to look at it. But I know wokeness provides a good frame to, as a catch-all for everything else. The watch out for local marketers is to make sure that it's embedded into the day-to-day, -day, not just, you know, yeah. A one-off thing. Okay, too much wokeness and zeitgeist on this uh, program today. <laughs> Last word to you, Pumi. I think that the conversation's being had, but it's going to take a while before our marketers have got the guts to pull off something like this. Because this is, you know, you, you put your, as it were, your neck on the line for this kind of thing. And I think that a lot of our marketers are very safe. They'd rather be safe than find themselves with clammy hands having to explain why they made the decisions they made. Yeah, neck on the line or beard on the line to both of you. Yeah. Thank, you <laughs> thank you very much uh, for joining us. So, was the outcry warranted or is it actually just shining a light on how we should act as men? You can let us know on our different social media platforms. Next on the program, how traditional publishing houses are responding to a fast-changing multimedia environment.